Indeed, we stand before you this morning, Lord, in, in full surrender to you. God, there is none like you, and no one can take your place. And Father, I just know that as we bow before you this morning, Lord, that heaven rejoices. As we surrender everything that we are to you. God, we're so grateful to have Wendy in our midst again this morning. Pray for her, Lord, as, as she has her first chemo treatment on Tuesday. God, I'm so grateful for the rain. I thank you, Lord, that, that we cannot make it rain and only you can. And Father, we stand before you this morning and ask, Lord, that you forgive us and, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. I'd like to welcome all those who are joining us um, on social media this morning, on YouTube. Thank you very much for, for joining us as we look at our sermon topic for today. We're at commandment number nine and I've entitled my, my sermon this morning Watch Your Tongue. Watch Your Tongue. And each of the commandments that we've looked at so far, we've seen that there's something deeper to it. It's not just what, it's not just skin deep. And so please allow me just to dig a little bit today. I don't know if any of you have ever watched the series The Crown. Mm. I was spoilt when, when our daughter-in-law was staying with us and, and we had access to net, Netflix. And uh, man, I was absorbed by this series, the little bit that I got to watch about it. But one thing that struck me was once a week, the Prime Minister, whoever that is, had to has to have an audience with the Queen for 30 minutes where, where they discuss matters of state and, and what is going on. But he also has to face that House of Commons once a week where they can ask him any question or her. They can say whatever they like. It's a brutal time. I remember the one episode where, where they said to Winston Churchill, man, you're just too old. Step down. He was only 70 something. Um, but, but it's a brutal time. But the one thing that happened in that meeting, in that time when the parliament was together, that nobody could ever call anybody else a liar. The use of the word lie or lies or liars with reference to any other member of parliament would lead to immediate expulsion um, of the member who was making that accusation. I don't know how many of you have ever been to London, been to Hard Corner, and stood on the soapbox. You're not allowed to speak about politics, you're not allowed to speak about the Queen, and you're not allowed to speak about religion. You can speak about anything else standing on the soapbox in Hyde Park, forget it. I was in Hyde Park just before Easter, I gave the girls the Easter service on the soapbox. <laughs> Calling somebody a liar is deep offensive. I don't know if anybody's ever called you a liar. And of all the struggles that we experience in relationships, the challenge of forgiving someone who has lied to you is surely the hardest. Other things seem so easy to forgive, but a lie
you know, lies are the devil's native language. It's his mother tongue. In John 8, 44, Jesus says, You are children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. From the beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there's no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him. Because Satan is a liar and he is the father of all lies. And perhaps this is why deception and lies leave such ugly scars on us. Somebody said to me yesterday, scars are wonderful things because it means I've been wounded but I've healed. Can I say that again? Scars are such wonderful things because it means I've been wounded but I've been healed. The good news on the other side of this is that God cannot lie. And I'm going to point out two scriptures to you. If you write down anything today, then these are the two scriptures that you write down. If you mark anything in your Bible, whether that's with a pencil, with a highlighter, with lipstick, with mascara, with whatever you mark in your Bible, then these are the two verses that you mark. And the first one, is in 1 Titus 2, where Paul writes and says, based on, on the hope of eternal life, God, who does not lie, has promised us this life before the beginning of time. God promises us eternal life. And God knew that he had to make the plan for us right at the beginning. The other one, that you mark is Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 where Moses says God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should lie. In God there is no untruth. You see God is not like us. God is not like us. Okay everybody close your eyes. You've got to put up your hand. Those of you who taught your children to lie, put up your hands. Okay. God is not like that. Truth is written all over God's nature. He cannot deceive you and God will not mislead you. And if there's one person you can trust on this earth, then that is God. Then that is God. I know that I never ever taught my children to lie. But we lie. It just sort of comes naturally. Because we find God so difficult to believe. And so I guess I needed to ask God after I'd started doing my prayer, God, why did you give us this commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not lie. Well, I reckon it's because God wants us to be like him. And that is to be truth tellers. People who are worthy of trust. Because trust is probably the most important thing in life. There's nothing more important than trust. Nothing more important than trust. You trust your spouse and because that's why you married that person. Because you trust them. You trust your friends with things that some of us will never tell our families. Because we trust them. I used to have a poster in my classroom at Girls High which said, I will never give up on my friends. They know too much. <laughs> and that's the truth. 
You see, God wants you and me to deal in the truth and not in lies. In precision rather than distortion and in honesty rather than deception. If I really boil this, this commandment down, it deals with the issue of perjury. Perjury means to stand in court and make a statement that you know is not true. And the punishment for that is what we've all seen in our news this last week. 200,000 or four years. But this is what had happened to Jesus when he was arrested and brought to trial. The people knew that he was innocent of the things that they were accusing him of. And what did they do? They lied. They lied. They committed perjury. And one person had to be put to death. And you know, sometimes we do that to the people around us. But this, this commandment reaches far beyond that. I think we've all seen that the commandments reach far beyond the courtroom. I love the analogy that Smith made. He said that every commandment is a railway track and it stops along stations before it gets to its final destination. And the final destination of this train is to be called a liar. You know that word you know that they use in Parliament in England? But there's stations along the way. And I want to stop at a couple of these stations today. The first way we lie is to flatter people. Flattery is nothing short of a lie. In essence, um, it's, saying, it, it's saying something which would achieve a desired result without regard as to whether it's true or not. Flattery is saying something to somebody's face that you would never say behind their back. Can I say that again? Flattery is saying something to somebody's face that you would never say behind their back. You see, we, we flatter people when we want to make a good impression. When, when we say the things we think the other person wants to hear. Flattery doesn't sound, sound as bad as perjury, right? But it's on the same row along. And it stops at a station. The next station we get to is called exaggeration. This is when we overstate things. When, when we tell people that we've accomplished X, Y, and Z, uh, when we didn't actually do it. Um, and then we take the credit for it. And that has happened so often in this country. So often when, when we're looking for a little bit of sim sympathy or katzbuch, you know, whichever one you want, we, we overstate what's wrong with us. And then, then I don't just have um, a bump on my toe, I've almost broken my leg. Um, and, and all we do is we say things like it when we want people to feel sorry for us. But we also do the opposite. When we're half dead, but we say nothing. You see, by hiding and excluding or exaggerating stuff, that we want other people to know, we actually unbalance their healthy sense of judgment. And so then we have people planning our funeral when actually all I've got is a holy mark too. <laughs> the third station is gossip. No, Methodists don't gossip, we share. We don't skin up. We share. Oy vey. We pass on news about other people. 
that is not true. And very often we pass that news on with the intent to hurt that person. And then the lie is either in our words or in our motive. People, please, if you've got nothing good to say about somebody, don't say it. I was very tempted to bring a feather pillow here today. I think, Fricky, and I have only got one feather pillow at home. And to stand over there and cut it and hope the wind would blow. Because you know what would happen? There would be feathers scattered everywhere. And gossip is like that. It scatters the feathers everywhere. And before you know it, before you know it, more than half the country knows about what you've said. Because it just grows exponentially. The other thing that I do, the next station is called half truth. It's when when I tell you something, but I leave out the essential bits that are crucial to this whole story. And that's paramount to life. That is paramount to life. See, if I'm going to tell you something, then I must tell you all of it. I mustn't leave out the bits that put me in a bad light or put somebody else in a bad light or, or don't give you the essence of what you need to deal with. If there's healing to be had in any relationship in which trust has been broken, then the truth needs to be told. The truth needs to be told. It's almost the opposite of exaggeration. But you know what? We leave out the stuff that, the stuff that is essential because we are scared that the story won't sound credible enough. And then there's another station called White Lies. I don't care what color the lie is, whether it's pink or blue or white or black or yellow or whatever color it is. There are no big lies or small lies. There are no essential lies at all. There are no lies of fashion or size. Doesn't matter. The color is not important. It is a lie. We cannot misrepresent the truth by giving it a different color. They're all equally disgusting in the sight of God. That made me stop and think. My lies are disgusting in the sight of God. And then I went to Proverbs chapter 6. Can I ask you to read that when you get home? We've been, we've been dealing with, with the Ten Commandments. Listen to one of... Um, of the headings in my book, the folly of in indolence, that's being lazy. The wicked man, beware of adultery. And I realized that Solomon here is speaking about these ten commandments that were given to Moses. But listen to what he writes in Proverbs chapter 6 um, and from verse 12. A worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. In other words, he walks with a mouth that doesn't tell the truth. He winks with his eyes, shuffles his feet, and points with his fingers. And perversity is in his heart, lust. He desires evil continually and sows discord. Therefore his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly he will be broken without remedy. And we all know that that happens to all of us. You go from hero to zero in seconds when you've told a lie. Please, you've got to be very clever if you want to tell lies. Because they're going to turn on and bite you on the bone. 
If you can't remember the lies you've told to people, please quit telling lies. Because they're going to bite you. And then what happens is you lose your credibility. And then in verse 16, Solomon writes and says, These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. You want to count them down with me? A proud look. A lying tongue. That's number two. Hands that shed innocent blood, thou shalt not murder. A heart that devises wicked plans, thou shalt not commit adultery. Feet that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And one who sows discord amongst the brethren. I don't want to be guilty of wit of driving a wedge in the congregation of the two churches that I've got. That's discord. I don't want to be guilty of that. The punishment is too great. It's God's black blacklist. We cannot make excuses for it. We can't speak it away. There's a need for us each to become people of integrity. Not fair weather friends, but people who can be trusted. Truth is hard for sinners because it never puts us in a pure light. Somewhere deep inside the human heart there's an instinct that wants to make us hide from the truth. We like to think of ourselves as seekers after truth, but in the reality, we actually run away from it. The scripture says in Romans 3, from 10 to 18, as the scripture says, there's no one who is righteous, no one who is wise, or who worships God. All have turned away from God. They've all gone wrong. And no one does what is right, not even one. Their words are full of deadly deceit. Wicked lies roll off their tongues and dangerous threats like a snake's poison from their lips. That's skinner. That's slander. Their speech is filled with bitter, bitter curses. They're quick to hurt and kill. They leave ruin and destruction wherever they go. They have not known the path of peace, nor have they learned the reverence of God. I don't know how many of you have watched that movie, A Few Good Men. Uh, the cross-examiner uh, asks the guy in the dock, and please don't ask me these actors' names, I don't know. He says, I want the truth. And it's all about the scene in the wall. And this guy comes back and says, you can't handle the truth. And perhaps that's our problem. Perhaps that's our problem. There's a broad road that, that leads to deception and We've all fallen into that trap. You see, the whole Bible is this unfolding story and the final exposition of a massive deception that began in the Garden of Eden. And it will end in the destruction of all liars in the lake of fire in Revelation 21 verse 18. And in the middle of this great drama, we have what John, Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Virtually every lie that is told can be traced back to the activity of Satan. Jesus describes Satan as a liar and as the father of all lies. He says, you are children of your father, the devil. 
You want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Please, people, let's, let's look at it and see it for what it is today. It's not that big lie that I've told. It's those little ones that make the rucksack on my back too heavy. Satan's odyssey of lies began when he lost touch of reality um, in heaven and conceived the notion that instead of him worshipping God, God needed to worship him. And God kicked him and a third of his angels out of heaven. And then when God placed man and woman in that beautiful garden, it was Satan's desire to bring them down. It's his desire to bring you down. He doesn't want you to live a victorious Christian life. He wants you to be buckled. He wants you to be, the Afrikaans has got the best word for it, knee halter. You know when you tie those, those straps around the horse or the ox's knees, that they can't walk? That's what Satan wants to do to each and every one of us. And he approaches Eve with this question, and all he does is he creates a little bit of doubt. He says, did God really say that? What's he calling God? A liar. He needed to be expelled from Parliament there and then. <clears throat> but he wasn't. You see, if we're not sure about God, what God is telling us to do, then we're not going to obey it. And Satan creates that doubt. Just that little bit of doubt. Such a pity. These same doubts were created in Pilate's mind when Jesus was brought before him. You see, Pilate was so accustomed to hearing everybody's white lies, exaggerations, flatteries, that when Jesus stands before him, Pilate says to him, they say you're the king, are you? Jesus says, you say that I am. And then Pilate challenges Jesus and says, what is the truth? Because he's so used to wearing, to hearing lies that he cannot discern the truth from a lie when Jesus is standing in front of him. I'm not coming up for Pilate, eh? But I am saying that there were things that were happening. You see, the bottom line is where truth falls, justice will prevail. When the truth is told, justice will prevail. We live in a land where there's been so many lies. Eh? And maybe you're just so tired of them. I am. You see, the biggest problem with a lie is that it keeps you from the truth. That's the problem. <clears throat> what is the truth? The truth is that Jesus came as the only Son of God to give his life for each and every one of us. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The truth is that if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Satan hates the word of God. And every time you open it, he's going to bring another question to mind to make you cast doubt on this word that you're reading. Please don't fall for his lies. God is not a man that he should love. 
what happens when I become, a, when honesty becomes my character choice, when, when I look in the mirror, do I see an honest person? But what happens when, when I get to this place, when, when I listen to Jesus, where he says to me, let your yes be your yes, and your no be your no. What happens when I become a truth teller is that I trust God's ways. That's the first thing. I strengthen myself by being trustworthy. And I build trust in a mistrusting world. When Moses was, was questioned in the desert, and he was one of the greatest leaders in, in the Old Testament and probably one of the most tempted people as well. He wrote, Numbers 23 verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he not said he will do it? Has he not spoken and he will make good? his word. Yesterday somebody sent me a, a little message on WhatsApp which read, use your voice for kindness, use your ears for compassion, your hands for charity, your mind for truth, and your heart for love. And that happens when I become a person of integrity in Jesus' name. Amen.